one. Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. I'm trying to stream from home today. It's been a little bit since I've done it, and I think my computer's got some cobwebs built up in it, and it's telling me it doesn't like what it's doing. But we're going to plow ahead with our study um, at the building where I normally do the study from. Cox has had to do some maintenance work in the area, and so we got the notification that we will be out without internet for the day, or at least intermittently. So we'll see how this goes. If for some reason the stream breaks down, we'll probably keep going with the study, um, but I am recording it, so we'll see what happens. Um, if you start seeing serious issues though, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, please let me know. Let me know for sure. All right, let's bring everyone into the study today. That was just Paul. Now we have everybody. <laughs> So let's jump right into it. We will not hold you late. Uh, we tried last week doing a little bit better. We are running behind today, but that's not your fault. It's ours. So we'll plan to be done at the top of the hour. We left off last week, guys, in John chapter 3, there in verse number 19. Uh, John 3, verse 19. As, as we've mentioned before, if uh, you're watching this on our Facebook page, then feel free to drop a comment on this live video feed. If you're viewing this on our YouTube channel, do the same thing. Use the comments, the chat area there, I should say, and let us know if you have any thoughts or comments. Um, starting with this, Paul, I'm going to have you to start reading. And I want to do a little bit just a background read because we're jumping into an odd place in the context. So let's start with Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus there in verse three and take us down to verse 18. I'm sorry. Read down through verse 21, if you would. That would be a better, be okay, a little lengthy John, read, but it sets the context. John 3, 3 through 21? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll be reading uh, in the New King James Version, if that matters. And so um, I'll begin John 3 at verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, 
that they have been done in God. All righty, thank you, Paul. We um, had covered, as I mentioned earlier, down through verse 19. Um, and what and I had someone make this point before I thought it was real interesting. Many times people like to quote John 3, verse 16, and stop there. And that sounds all warm and fuzzy, if, if you would. But they neglect the severity that is seen in verses 18 and following there. Um, for instance, he it talks about he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. And then 19 talks about this is condemnation. The light has come to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And then everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Um, so the idea of simply believing in Jesus is much more than believing in Jesus. It is a full-blown walking in the light, listening to his word. Any thoughts or any comments about this section here? Brendan? Well, on that same point, John, um, reading a book recently, an author makes some really good points that because American Christianity, broadly speaking, um, we have, there's so many misunderstandings about what faith and belief is that he's making the case that instead of faith, because the Greek word pistos would allow it, we need to be thinking more allegiance, fidelity, that you are saved by your fidelity. Well, what does that include? Fierce, absolute loyalty to Jesus the King, doing his will, accomplishing his work of showing your loyalty and devotion to him by being a participant in his kingdom. And you see that, I think, in the last two verses that were read. The one who practices uh, the, not the truth or the darkness, they're not in the kingdom. But the one who does the truth. Because when you look at all the gospel accounts, Jesus really emphasizes doing the truth. He emphasizes when the rich young ruler came to him, good teacher, what must I do in order to be saved? Jesus doesn't say, oh, just believe. No, he says, keep the commandments. And then there's that exchange further there. Uh, you know, you see that repeatedly. There's this idea of having faith in Christ means I'm committing to the life Christ would have me to live, which requires active obedience to his revealed will. It requires devotion and loyalty to him as my king and me being, me being willing to do anything the king would have me to do. Um, those are my thoughts just on kind of dovetailing your, your comments there. So, All right. Any thoughts about that? I think he's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... And it's one of those things where really you're... Bel Someone says, I believe in Jesus. But until they begin to strive to live the way that we're supposed to live, they really have no idea what true belief actually is. You know, and I like the, I like the comparison to being an, an allegiance there. So also, it's, it's much more. Mm -hmm. ignores the context of John 3, 5. That there may be born of water and the spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so he's already introduced the idea of water baptism. So there would be no need to bring it up again. Because as, uh, as Brendan pointed out, faith allegiance involves necessarily the obedience to any command issued uh, to us while we were alien sinners or issued to us now that we are children of God. Yeah, that's a good point. That's yeah, good yeah. point. You know, you know, the sad reality uh, today is no different than what it was like in the first century. You know, when you've got the idea of uh, men love darkness rather than light in verse 19 uh, because their deeds were evil, you know, just remember contextually that Jesus was dealing with the Jews who were supposed to know the law. And, and, and I think it's one of the things that we're struggling with in our society today because our society is so dark in so many ways spiritually. And, and I think it's bled into many congregations of the Lord's people. And uh, there are men that love darkness and there are preachers and congregations 
that are sweeping that under the carpet rather than rather than addressing the sinful behaviors that Christians, professed Christians, are engaging in. I'm, I mean, we 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 got to understand. God God expects us to submit to His will, and uh, we can't sweep that under the carpet. And to that point, Tom, yeah. I would add one layer to that. I think we're seeing just a widespread indifference and yep. apathy, not only from the world, which that comes and goes, you know, and in many ways, I would argue apathy about God's word. It's a harder challenge than outright hatred of it. If, right. in mind, if you think about, oh, yeah. When the church has persecution, you know what you believe and why you believe it, and you stand firm on that, and the pretenders are out of the way. Indifference? No one really cares. But this indifference also is creeping in w- to the Lord's people uh, in the idea of discussions about, like, well, that doctrine really isn't a... No, doctrine matters. Yes, exactly. Doctrine matters because right belief should result in right practice and if your doctrine's messed up your practice is going to be messed up mm-hmm. find an interest in the hebrew writer before he ever gets to any mention of practical application he spends a lot of time on proper doctrine paul every one of his letters first half always proper doctrine in order to get the proper application um it's important um and in an apathetic world that loves darkness uh, the Lord's people have to double down and recommit to, yes, the doctrine of Christ matters. And it matters because if we don't get this right, our behaviors and our life is not going to be right. You can't have one or the other. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, like I said, and, um, and it grieves me when brethren sweep obedience under the carpet. Yeah. And, 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 and they... And they'll they'll say no, we're not. You know, we believe in obedience, but like you said, there's an indifference, and especially, especially toward doctrines that um, they're they're dangerous doctrines because if you leave them alone, if you ignore them, you know, I I don't have to be a prophet to promise you that if you ignore something this generation, the next generation is going to take it further. You know, what Jesus is dealing with in the Pharisees, they did not get there overnight. If, uh, I, you're looking at generations of developed corruption, uh, and that's the reality of it. And, and so, you know, and here's the warning that Jesus is giving to Nicodemus. Yes, we have to believe in him, but we've got to understand what belief is. That's why it's so important to drive home the point, belief and faith. While sometimes it's talking about the individual exclusive act itself, but quite often contextually, the idea of believe and the idea of faith is an inclusive term, a collective term. You know, we're saved by grace through faith. Grace is everything that God does. Faith is what we do. Uh, I mean, and they're they're inclusive terms. And so we have to keep that in mind. And, And Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to understand that and I think it applies to us too well I I correct that it does apply to us too okay you know that verse 21 is a particularly important verse um and I want to kind of build on some things that Tom kind of talked towards and, and mentioned truth is one of the big ideas of the book of John uh he's going to use truth as a concept of a of a thing that exists uh, he'll talk about worshiping in spirit and in truth the next chapter. Well, you have to kind of know what truth is. We don't get you to pick. A lot of times people say, well, here's what I think it means. He defines it in the book of John. He'll tell us in John 17, 17, the word is truth. Um, you know, he'll, he'll help us to get a sense of what it is we're talking about. The concept of what God gives us, and I always like to say, is capital T truth. It's the thing that is, um, you know, undeniable. It exists apart from us. We either choose to pursue it or we don't. We don't make it up. And, um, you know, that the postmodernism uh, of the world today wants to say, well, truth is, you know, variable with each person. John is trying to convey a very, very straightforward idea. The truth is absolute. Doesn't matter what you think. Truth exists. Truth is absolute. 
In this case, he's saying truth and light are the same thing. They, they have this connection so that anything that's darkness is not true. Now, where this comes up, and Tom made a couple of applications that I just think are profoundly important to consider. Number one, you know, um, all the time here on the West Coast, probably everywhere, you, you find men who preach the gospel, but they say, well, there's some things I believe that I don't tell people. You know, um, uh, j just recently I was engaged in a written debate with somebody who said, don't don't print this debate. Don't share this debate. I don't want everybody to know what I'm what I'm thinking. You know, very much a verse 21 kind of statement where somebody's saying, let's kind of keep this in the darkness, so to speak. I don't want people to know what it is that we have to say. If you're at a church where the preacher or the elders say, yeah, there's some things that we believe that we don't want to teach, you should be worried because that's that's not truth. Truth is in the light. Truth is out there and exposed. You might think of Paul telling Timothy that we're not given a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of boldness. We're not supposed to say, you know, I'd like to preach on um, baptism, but I don't want, you know, to upset people or things like that. That's that's a darkness mindset that is denying truth, that's, that's moving away from truth. Um, to the second point, maybe you're in a congregation that says things, and Tom really alluded uh, closely on this, to say, um, you know what, there are things that are going to cause controversy, so we just don't talk about those things. You know, uh, these are things that maybe we don't all have the same understanding of. We're afraid it'll cause problems, so we don't talk about these things for the sake of peace. That's an anti-truth uh, position to take. That's a position that says, let's keep some things in the darkness because we don't want them exposed to the light. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem that, you know, if you, you hear that kind of talk in your congregation, that should worry you because if there are things that can't survive being exposed to the light out in the open, you know, in front of everybody, it's it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. So those are some good applications to the points we've made here. Verse 21 is an important point. It's a very practical point that we should be able to say, take this passage and then handle it and use it in discerning things around us. Right. Okay. And, and, and understand, uh, and you know, dealing with some discussions that are going on right now um, among brethren and so on, uh, I just want to make a statement that when we make this observation, we're not ignoring the grace of God. You know, uh, we 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 have to understand that. You know, uh, we have we only reason we have hope is because of God's grace. And by the way, I would appeal to John three sixteen, if you're talking about the grace of God. You know, because uh, that ties into Ephesians, uh, uh, Ephesians uh, two four, two verses four through nine. Uh, you've got that situation. We're not ignoring God's grace when we say that because of God's grace, we need to do what God tells us to do. You know, it is impossible to emphasize God's word and at the same time ignore grace because God's word is grace. Exactly. And, and I like what John says in verse 21, uh, 20 and 21, practicing evil is juxtaposed with doing the truth. And so the truth involves action. Uh, the truth demands things of us. And either we are practicing evil or we are doing uh, the truth. And those who do the truth, they are not uh, opposed to coming to the word to, to make sure that their deeds are indeed, uh, have been done uh, in God. And, uh, but those who are practicing evil, they don't want, they don't want their deeds exposed. They don't, they don't want to come to the light. And so they are the ones who are denying God's grace by denying uh, the possibility of his word uh, influencing them for good. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts on that? I don't want to belabor it too much, too much longer. Um, but when looking at, there, there's two words that kind of strike me between 20 and 21. And I don't think y'all have touched on this. If you did, sorry, I, I've, then I missed it. But verse number 20, I'll bring it up here. Notice the key word practicing. Everyone practicing evil hates the light. Okay. And then when you look down verse 21, 
But he who does the truth, the L, the Legacy Standard Bible says, I believe, he who practices the truth. Um, the point that I'm kind of making here is that, and I think y'all have already touched on this, maybe not directly, but very, very well indirectly. It is the idea that whether we're talking about the local church and what Brian was talking about earlier, or just in our own individual lights, we can say we love Jesus all day long, but if we go on sinning, and that's the terminology the ESV uses in looking at the writings of John and 1 John, if we go on sinning, if we continue to practice evil and not practice the truth, then no matter amount of verbal confession is going to make us right before God. That makes sense. I mean, we, we've got to have a desire to put it away. That's why we come to the truth and we then become triumphant over the wickedness in our lives because we love the truth more than we love evil. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's the present tense verbs. Both of those are are present tense verbs, which yeah. means uh, which means ongoing action. You know, you're you're not talking about that one that slips, that occasionally sins. You're talking about the life of sin or or persisting in some sinful behavior yeah I, I would i would suggest that if an individual continues to engage in a christian continues to engage in any sin they know it's wrong they say i just can't defeat it right now i'll, I'll try later but I, I can't help myself right now they're out of fellowship with god because they're walking in darkness and until they repent they'll remain out of fellowship uh, Brendan, sorry, go ahead. Well, to that point, um, having taught Revelation last year, teaching general epistles this year, and now we're studying Gospel John, um, I'm just seeing all three of those, well, five of those books have different purposes, but the themes are the same, and John deals with a lot of these issues in different ways. And in 1 John 1 and beginning of 2, uh, mm -hmm. he makes a point. Here's the goal, verse 1 of chapter 2, don't sin. Okay, does that always happen? No, that's why verse two, Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. He's our advocate. Um, so even John recognizes, but in earlier in chapter one, you have to look at the overall course of your life. Are you walking in the direction of the light or are you walking in the direction of the darkness? Um, because you can say you love Jesus all day long, which John deals with, but by your actions, if you hate the brethren, if you don't love the brethren, if you are engaging in habitual sin that you're not actively fighting against, that's where the problem is at. Um, and you you got to be careful, as Paul warned Timothy, that there will be some whose consciences are branded as, as seared with, with, as with the branding iron. You can get so comfortable in your sin that you begin to justify it. Uh, how many brethren have we known preach truth until they themselves or someone close to them got involved in a sinful situation and suddenly, oh, I have restudied the issue. And yep. it's never it's never restudying the issue when you're still preaching truth on it. It's always when, the, when crisis happens and suddenly you find a justification. And so for the practical standpoint, God's grace comes in. You, you can maintain fellowship if you follow 1 John. You're walking towards the light. You're confessing your sins. You're striving to put to death the deeds of the body, Romans 8. The problem comes in is when you stop feeling that godly sorrow, when you stop being troubled by your sins, that's a dangerous marker of a seared conscience. And that's where we got to we be on guard with. Yeah. Good point. A real Good quick point. A real quick comment. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, I, and I think Brendan was kind of uh, speaking to this too, sometimes we're not exactly aware of it ourselves. But a very simple test is this. If I don't want other people to know about it, if it's something I do that I don't want people to see, there's a darkness element to that, that I have to acknowledge maybe I've got a problem. Even if I don't want to acknowledge I have a problem. And, and I'm as bad as anybody about maybe having a practice that I might not want somebody to know about. But the point is, that's a good sign. It could be a work of darkness. I've long thought that when somebody is struggling with something, that is a good sign. The problem is when they stop struggling and give themselves yeah. over to the thing that with which they had been struggling. And so I and commend people when they say, well, I'm struggling with this. Well, that's, that's, that's a good. great point. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. You know, 
Brian, I think you taught a lesson one time. This was years ago um, about Jacob wrestling with the angel. And I don't remember much from that lesson other than you made the point, God loves wrestlers um, in the true WWE fashion. No, I'm kidding. But God loves wrestlers. The reason why the Christian life is described as a race, as warfare, fighting sin is not a walk in the park. And if you are feeling discouraged, hopefully this, I mean, it's not going to make the struggle any easier, but the struggle is good. You, you need to be wrestling with that. You need to be striving. And, and in that, you need to know you're not alone. Your brethren are all striving and all wrestling, and they're here there to support you. Um, and one little admonishment here. Don't believe for a second says, well, I can't handle this sin right now. I'll, I'll, work, I'll work on other areas in my Christian life, and I'll come back to that. God has a funny way of you'll keep on hitting against that same sin, and until you start dealing with that sin, you will not grow in other areas. You just won't. But that, that's hindering you from so many other areas of growth. And so maybe you've been putting off. Maybe you're discouraged. Deal with it today. Take active, proactive steps. Contact brethren that you feel very comfortable with to confess that and and find strength in. And I will tell you, Satan's lie will say they're going to look at you differently. They're going to treat you like a, a an awful, evil person. No, they will not. You need to find somebody you can confide in and confess that. Because I'll tell you, it will it will lift a spiritual weight off your soul, and it will give you new courage and new strength to fight that sin. Um, we are. We're serious about this. And John, more context, John's writing this gospel and his general epistles and revelation to Christians who are struggling and they're tired. They're wrestling and they need the encouragement. And here in these last two verses, we're seeing that your feelings aren't always trustworthy. So look at your life. Is the overall course of your life practicing truth? You're going in the right direction. Keep going in that direction. That's a good point. Um, one more last thought, um, and I think, I don't know if you, y'all did touch on this earlier, verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. There's just one other, another reason why our light so shines before men, so they may see your good works and glorify the father who is in heaven. All right. Any thoughts about that? All right, let's let's continue with our reading now, John chapter three, and let's start in verse number twenty-two. And let's see, Brian, if you would, let's kind of start there in twenty-two, but we'll break this one up a little bit. Let's read down through verse twenty-six, and we'll stop with the question that is posed to John, and then we'll discuss it, and then go after in the section following that. All right, John chapter 3, verses 22 through 26 in the New King James Version. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Enon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Um, I don't like that stopping point. Read one more verse. Right. John answered <laughs> and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That kind of left us hanging there just a little bit there, didn't it? It was tough. All right. Yeah. So let's back up now to verse number 22. We have Jesus and disciples. They're coming then into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. So now John shares something a little bit, not different, but now we see another aspect of what Jesus and his apostles were doing. They were baptizing as well. So do you want to talk about maybe the difference between Jesus's baptism at this point and John's baptism because verse 33 23 says now John also was baptizing 
Well, I think that's an important question. And the, it's important because the answer needs to be that what Jesus was doing, and by the way, that we'll find out later, Jesus himself isn't doing the baptizing, but his disciples right. are, is, is John's baptism. And it's important to understand that because the baptism of Christ is a baptism into Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. He hasn't died yet. It cannot be the baptism of Christ, which is, according to Ephesians chapter 4, the one baptism that we have today. Yeah. Could also, these disciples... Oh, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. You know, I anticipated a question that you didn't really ask. Why does he say John also? as opposed to Jesus also. Okay. But the, the account is about Jesus. Yeah. Following Jesus' uh, footsteps as he goes through his ministry. And so uh, he and his disciples came in the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. And then as an aside, John also was baptizing, which he has already indicated uh, by referencing John's baptism of Jesus. But I, I think that shows right there that John was already taking a second uh, a second chair uh, beneath beneath Jesus, even though uh, the, the baton has not yet been completely passed uh, okay. to Jesus. Yet he's already taking a back seat. Okay. But I think it also, and I think you're right, but I think it also adds weight to the role that the preparatory role that this baptism played in preparing the way for the coming of the new covenant um, for both John and Jesus's disciples about what baptism unto remission of sins unto repentance remission of sins um, it wasn't just something that John himself did and his disciples, but also the disciples of Jesus did it. It was all part of the repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand preparatory teaching. Yeah. Even though John uh, said, I will baptize you, I baptize you with water, but he will be, mm -hmm. he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit uh, and fire. He's not yet gotten to that point. Matter of fact, uh, that does not occur until Pentecost. Uh, and right. so in the meantime, Jesus through his disciples is baptizing in water but there will come a time and did come a time on pentecost that he baptized the apostles uh with the holy spirit yep mm -hmm. and commissioned them to baptize in water yeah if we wanted to open the discussion up even further and, and i don't i don't want to do this so just forget what i'm about to say we <laughs> we could discuss in Acts chapter 2, when he talks about the prophet Joel, and in those days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Um, not in the way that, you know, miraculous apostolic we see with the apostles, but just the general fellowship and acceptance. Um, I'm sorry, the Lord accepting people all over the world into his fellowship, pouring his spirit upon all flesh. If you were to take that approach to that, that passage in Joel and Acts. Um, that could be maybe another reference to he will baptize you with with uh, spirit but that's kind of a weak connection I, it's I think it may be two different discussions altogether all right any thoughts um, okay so just some minor details there as, as Bob pointed out a while ago this text is more about Jesus he does make a reference to John he was also baptizing in the anon um, anon I guess anon near Salem, uh, because there was much water. Oftentimes that verse is used to substantiate the idea that baptism is immersion. The fact that there was there was much water there, and I think it'd be a valid point. Um, okay, any thoughts or comments? Let's see, 24 and 25. So, then there arose a dispute among some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. All right, so let's talk about that. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. All right. What's the thoughts about this, verse 25 and 26? Are they two different things or the same thing? Brendan. Um, maybe both and. Um, but I think what you see here is Jesus' own disciples do this later uh, when 
somebody is casting out demons in the name of Christ that weren't they weren't part of the inner circle, they weren't part of the the larger crowds. Um, and I, I think it's a it's a human tendency to show loyalty to teachers and instructors or you know that kind of thing. And there's a human tendency to be jealous or be concerned when somebody else is drawing away disciples. I think you see this as the main cause of the jealousy of the Jews, not only in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts. I think you see this um, here with John's own disciples. And it, it could be a place of genuine concern, you know. Um, he's he's stealing from your ministry or he's, you know, pulling people away or whatever. And and honestly, a, a modern application, I, I, I don't think there there isn't an eldership or a preacher that maybe wouldn't raise an eyebrow if members of their congregation start leaving in droves for another group. You know, there may be some questions there. Is the teaching not sufficient? Are we doing something wrong? Is there some sort of appeal over there? There is some level of concern there. Um, but here, I think with John's disciples, um, they're they're wondering if Jesus is being a usurper. Now we're going to see with John's further comments that no, he's not. Um, but this dispute here, the Jews had many disputes in the first century about purification. Um, even between Sadducees and Sadducees, um, there was debates about that. Um, Jesus himself began debates about washing of hands in a ceremonial way or not. And so you have to think about John's baptism though. And we just touched on it's the preparatory baptism for the gospel, but also this is the, to my knowledge, the only time we see a baptism in the Old Testament connected to repentance and remission of sins. And that means it's something apart from the sacrifices. Now, there's a dispute later that comes up that they, the Jews had this understanding that Messiah could have the authority to do that, or a prophet could have the authority to do that. And so there's perhaps maybe a debate about what is John's role? Is he Elijah? Because Elijah would have authority to, to do that. Um, maybe some guys are already saying, no, this guy can't be Elijah because, well, he's not bald or whatever, right? Uh, <laughs> so the dispute there could be, does John even have the right to do this kind of thing? Um, but again, all we have is a debate arose among the disciples of John and the Jews about purification. We're not told exactly what it is. But there's several options of what it could be based on other debates we see in the Gospels. So those are my okay. long thoughts there. All right. All right. Any other thoughts on that? You know, I want to say this about much water. While I think it is a legitimate argument that that certainly does imply uh, immersion, that is not the reason uh, the Apostle John brings it up. He's bringing it up to show that there is sufficient water to baptize these multitudes uh, that are coming to oh, him. Oh, good point. Uh, but, uh, and you wouldn't need all that if if you were going to merely sprinkle a little water on their heads because this can be collected back up and and reused. And uh, and so, yeah, the, the multitudes, and, and then he mentions the multitudes did come out uh, because this was an opportune place for uh, for many, many people to be, uh, to be, uh, to be baptized. And, uh, there was something else, uh, I was going to say, uh, but, uh, that escapes me. So I'll stop there. Would that be an indication, Bob, that John was not doing all of the baptizing? You know, we don't, we don't know. Uh, it's possible. It's a I fair mean, inference, not, but I don't think it's a necessary one. I mean, because to say that there's plenty of room to baptize all of these people uh, would, I mean, if John was baptizing them one by one, it wouldn't matter if there was, an, as long as there was enough room for one. But yeah. Uh, yeah, but you could have all these people walking out into the water and that would save time. If they're all walking into the water en masse, uh, and then he's just baptizing them. Then they all walk back instead of him walking back to the shore and getting another one and bringing him out there. It would be uh, uh, a convenience. I see. Could, okay. you, could you baptize two people at once if you put a hand on each head and pushed them down? I don't see why not. Okay, just curious. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of facetiousness there. Um, 
Interesting. Same interesting thing. points, though. Yeah. All right. What I'm looking at now is um, we've not greeted everyone who has joined us today. Uh, I do want to do a shout out to um, Jeevan Jesse, I guess, from Hyderabad, India. So um, good to have you with us. Andy Walker's with us, and Walter, and Gregory Hinkley. Gregor Hinkley, sorry, Gregor, is with us as well. So we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our study. Guys, I think what we're going to do, um, oh, sure. Caleb, do you see a Caleb question Caleb threw in there? You know, because of Caleb, we're not going to be able to finish as far as what I wanted to get to today because I feel compelled to have Paul to answer Caleb's comment. Perfect choice. Perfect choice. What Caleb is this? Um, this is it's not um, the one in the Bible, if that helps. <laughs> you know what? That's sorry. My. The the quest the comment I threw up on the screen is not coming from what needs to be. So let me get back to you. Here's here's Caleb's comment specifically for Paul Adams. He says, "Can women baptize?" Oh, I'm sorry. That was for Brendan. <laughs> Paul's Paul's got something going on. Also, an office. excellent choice. Also, wow. an excellent choice. I have thoughts and I've studied that, but we can save that for another time. <laughs> um, yeah, he says I can't, can't get a woman baptize another woman yeah he says question I came across yesterday and people debating who can do the baptizing I I do I think, think that we we have so, to be careful very well, no that there are no restrictions no or uh, descriptions about qualifications to baptize yeah. someone that's a good way to say that. Alexander Campbell was baptized by a Baptist preacher. The yep. the emphasis in the Bible consistently is on the one being baptized, not the baptizer. That being said, uh, we might throw a few qualifications in there, such as if we're in a public assembly, we probably want to conduct that in a manner that's befitting to the public worship. Um, most often it's the preacher who does it. Um, but you know, I've heard of situations where two women are studying with a, a widow in a care home and they waited two hours for a man to get there. I'm like, no, they, if they're ready to obey the gospel, you you baptize yeah. them. Yeah. Um, you know, you do that. But other than that caveat, I I, I see no authority in the one doing the baptizing. Um, the, the emphasis is, does the person receiving it, do they believe that Jesus is the Christ and it's for the remission of sins? Do they believe that? Um, yeah. and you it can is. write me up for that, but oh, that, uh, it, it is yeah, interesting to see yeah. baptism <laughs> as an act of submission, yeah. uh, is that you have to, um, uh, allow yourself to be baptized. Uh, you have to submit to that. And, uh, that might, that might bring up some interesting discussion on the question that's been submitted. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Right. Uh, well, that's one of my favorite points I like to make is that I believe, I confess, I repent, you know, I hear, but I, I don't baptize. I am baptized. I like to go over to Titus chapter three, verse five, that mm. seems to indicate for us that, that the work being done in baptism is done by God, um, not the baptizer or the baptized. The work that is accomplished in baptism is God. And oh, great so point. I think that's, it. that's and, a really yeah, neat right. thought. But and that's, having, you know, having said all this, though. Uh, every example that we do have of people baptizing was always men. I There is not any example in that I'm aware of in Scripture of a woman doing the baptizing. And, and, and I'm, I'm appealing to silence on that. The, I'm appealing to the safe course. I, you know, I, I'm not necessarily saying it's wrong. And, and like I said, I, I kind of view it like the teaching. You know, we know that the Bible makes restrictions for what yeah. women can do in a public assembly as far as teaching. Uh, yeah, uh, if all you have is women around and a woman is there, let her baptize. Them. Let her baptize the woman that she's studying with. I, I definitely don't see an issue with that. But, but if there are men available, I just think the safe course is to have the man do it. 
Well, think think about this as well. That's 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 that that's right, Tom at truthfactor. Dot com. Oh yeah, oh, I got my picture Absolutely. up there. Um, so, a, a couple of thoughts here, real quick, on that. Um, we have to be careful. Are there any New Testament examples of a woman teaching anyone else to the point of conversion? We know women teach older women teach younger women, but yeah. do we have any examples of a woman teaching anyone, bringing them to the point of obedience? You know, the closest I can think is uh, Aquila and Priscilla, but she's mm -hmm. with Aquila there. Yeah. And that's only because she's mentioned first that we kind of draw that conclusion. Right. And by yeah. the way, it doesn't say that Apollos was baptized again either. Right. Uh, but it doesn't I would, say she was But it doesn't say he did what neither. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so you know. that's, that's what I'm saying. If, if we're going to say well, there's no examples of a woman baptizing someone, we can also say there's no example of a woman teaching someone to the point of conversion. You know, and so we, we kind of have to be, it's kind of like even church buildings. Well, is there an example in the Bible of, of a church building a building? Well, no, we see it's expedient because it's helpful. Well, I think this might fall in the same category. Yeah. Brendan, you that's have time. a... Well, no, that's time. Yeah, okay, we, it yeah, is 12 o'clock. Yeah, so, time, so thank you, Caleb, for really dis derailing our discussion. It's, it's all your fault. Um, <laughs> not at all. But it's a good time to stop though. Let's plan next week to pick up to the answer that the question is the question presented to John. We'll start with verse 27 and look at his answer. And and how did he deal with the thought that hey, Jesus his disciples are baptizing more than John and his disciples, more coming to him. So we'll look at that and continue in our study through John chapter 3 at this point, verse 27. All right, gentlemen, any other thoughts or comments? All righty. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If you do have any questions or comments, feel free to send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. That's questions at truthfactorlive.com. And we'll do our best to kind of bring them into our next discussion. If we can do that, we will certainly do that. All righty. We'll see you back here again next Thursday. We'll continue hopefully back in my office at that point um, at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time right here at live.truthfactor, um, well, dot com. Yeah, truthfactorlive.com, <laughs> that's it. And Truth Factor Live on YouTube and Facebook. All right, thanks everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week.